Thank you. Today we're going to talk about uh, applications of ocean color to fisheries. And I want to start with um, uh, a little bit of the history of this uh, topic. I want to start uh, in the days of the fishery for the great whales and the, the mariners who sailed uh, in the whaling fishery, uh, they knew uh, instinctively that differences in the color of the water that they could see when they looked over the side of the ship provided uh, information probably about the food of the whales and was uh, useful in their work. A famous example is one uh, William Scoresby, whose father was also a whaling captain, and he began to go to sea at age 11 in the whale fishery. And the family became very rich. So he retired from the fishery around age 40. He took holy orders and became a gentleman scientist. He published over 60 papers, in including papers with uh, James Jewell. And in his, in his home port of Whitby, they still pr proud of him and uh, named the beer after him. So uh, he wrote famous book about his uh, voyages in the, in the whale fishery. Now subsequently, another famous person, especially in this area, Alistair Hardy, was the chief zoologist on Dis Discovery Expedition with a, a, a particular mandate to study the relationship between whales and their plankton food. In other words, to formalize scientifically what Scoresby had already uh, published. Hardy did something else that's also very interesting and uh, to my mind is um, the first uh, thinking about ocean color in fisheries. He was employed by the um, British government, fishery department, to survey this area, Southwest Peninsula, from a small plane, such as were used for reconnaissance in the First World War. And the object of the reconnaissance was to see if they could find the schools or the shoals of herring and uh, mackerel. And this experiment was a, a, a total failure. However, he did remark uh, on the pronounced color fronts that he observed with the naked eye uh, observation, green water, in the channel and uh, this Atlant deep blue Atlantic water coming in. And he, um, he, he wrote this up uh, as uh, an observation. Subsequently, um, in, in actually in uh, 1956, he wrote this famous book, The Open Sea, Volume one was called The World of Plankton. I really recommend it. Uh, when this book came out, I was in the grammar school. It was purchased by the school library and I read it at the time. And in this book, he, he recalls the color fronts that he had seen. And he made this remark. If these color changes can be correctly interpreted, if we may in the future find aircraft being used to make rapid surveys of surface conditions in relation to fisheries. 
Now this is, uh, to me, this uh, predates any other such uh, remark. And I think little did he realize that within 20 years, it would not be just these Mickey Mouse planes, but it would be uh, highly sophisticated optical devices carried in Earth orbit that were making the rapid surveys. So this is another one of Hardy's uh, many contributions. Now, um, where does it, uh, where do we get to the fishery? Let's look at the relation of the, on a very large scale, global scale, fish catches uh, against uh, primary production. And you can see that there is uh, um, a very good general trend across all the oceans where as the primary production of the place uh, increases, so does the possibility for large fish catch. Okay, that's on the world scale. This is the European scale, data from Emmanuel Chasseau. Um, similar trend. Now, um, there, sh there should be nothing r remarkable about this. There'd be something wrong, perhaps, if we didn't find such a trend. You know, you begin to lose your faith in any kind of ecological theory. However, I'd like to suggest that uh, these pictures could be refined beyond what they are now for the following reason. Just look at this uh, schematic. We have phytoplankton making photosynthesis and primary production. And there has to be some um, respiration by the ecosystem. So some of the primary production, its function is going to be to provide the energy required for respiration of the pelagic ecosystem. In other words, this part of the primary production is not available to grow fishes. So rather than the total primary production, it should be the new primary production that people look at when they want to compare with fisheries. Because only this component is available or has capacity to grow new tissue in the ecosystem on, in, under equilibrium conditions. And if we were to take out fish faster than the rate of primary production, the ecosystem would collapse. So really, uh, to make the pictures like the last two I just showed, they should be based on the, on the new primary production. Remember, we made this distinction the other day, new regenerated and total primary production. <laughs> so that, um, something you might bear in mind. Now, um, going back to the more, more recent history of ocean color, the actual uh, device, the first one, Coastal Zone Color Scanner, began in 1978. And at the time, most of the work in primary production was on the theory. It was very difficult to get the data um, unless you were on the inside. Very difficult to get the data to calculate primary production. So some of us uh, 
spent lots of time working on the theory, also on the theory of radiative transfer. And up until 1990, there wasn't very much about fisheries. However, in 1992, there was a major socio-economic disaster in um, Canada where the cod fishery uh, collapsed in, in 1992. This is a fishery that had been in operation for 500 years. It, it was fished by the Portuguese, Spanish, British, uh, Americans, and was, uh, th was thought to have been a completely limitless uh, resource. It collapsed in 1992. And as a, as a government employee, a government scientist in a fisheries lab, I was asked uh, by the director in a very, very brief conversation, no more than uh, one or two minutes, could remote sensing uh, contribute anything to discussion about the ground fish uh, crisis? I said I would look into it. The major problem was that the CZCS sensor had already failed in 1986 and had not been replaced. So I gave some thought to what could be done and uh, we decide to uh, base our approach on uh, time series. So this is, this is the main area here. This is Grand Bank of Newfoundland, main area for the cod fishery. Um, and this is ocean color and temperature, this is the temperature field. And we decide to make uh, time series as the, as the key element. So time series, I think uh, Marie showed how to do that. You get your series of images, you pick out the place of interest, and you plot the evolution in time of the chlorophyll field at that place. There is a very strong seasonal signal with uh, in, in, uh, in, in that, this latitude um, with a very strong spring bloom here. And what's important for today as well is that we have strong fluctuations between years in the phase of this cycle. So the, the timing of this peak can change from year to year by more than six weeks. Okay. So, uh, in fact, we didn't know how volatile this uh, timing was before doing this study. But it's, uh, it can be at least six weeks. It really made a strong impression on me. So here's the kind of information you can get from the time series that you can uh, make them for any place, of course. And I'm going to show you how to read them in a minute. I'm going to show you two pictures, one from this place, number seven, and one from number eight. You see they're quite close to each other. And yet they are, in a way, quite different. So in this direction, you read the series for the different years. And in this direction, you read the cycle for a single year. So, for example, in the year 2000, this is the seasonal cycle at number seven. 
So despite the relative proximity of seven and eight, you can see that the autumn bloom is quite different in the two cases. And the strength of the spring bloom also quite different. So these pictures, when you analyze them in detail, are very informative. And so the time series uh, we made was this Canadian North Northwest Atlantic Zone Chlorophyll Time Series. It was later uh, copied or uh, mm. repeated for entire Latin America in a project called Antares. And then um, later again was made worldwide with this chlor chloro globally integrated network project. And although uh, there was no data for the reason I said that the CZCS had failed, we published a prospectus on how you would use these time series to study the effect of ecosystem variation on the survival of larval fish. That was in 1996. So the idea was that you would, you would look at the seasonal cycle as Marie showed in her talk and that you would extract these uh, objective metrics of the of the spring bloom, including the timing. So that was the basis of the approach. And it turned out that there was already in the literature a hypothesis, been there for a hundred years, about what, what uh, should happen. And this was on the assumption that the wild fish had adapted their reproduction to the climatological uh, bloom conditions that um, when the timing of the bloom in a particular year corresponded with the timing of uh, spawning of the fish or whether these two events uh, did not coincide very well, that these differences would account for a significant fraction of the variance between years in the survival of the larvae. And I think it's only with the access to remotely sensed data that we could have the opportunity to make an operational test of such a hypothesis at the relevant scale of time and space. So the idea then is to, in a particular year or in a, in, in a series of years, you characterize the spring bloom according to objective criteria, compare the indices with larval survival, then test whether the variance or significant variance of the larval survival could be accounted for by variations in these ecosystem uh, indicators. So this is uh, Nova Scotia here. And this is the area for the spawning. And the fish involved is a haddock. 
You may have a chance to eat some tonight. I'm not sure. Anyway, this is the area. And to do this work, you have to, um, if you're a remote sensing scientist, you have to make friends with a fishery scientist. So completely independently, we had a colleague who was supplying us with the survey data for Haddock. So we have two, two independent lots of data. And what we calculate here, what we show here in the color, are the anomalies in timing of the spring bloom. So when the, when the color is red, it means earlier than, timing of the bloom is earlier than the climatological average. When it's green, it means late compared with the climatological average. So these are the results that we got. Larval survival index is a technical thing um, versus the anomalous in the timing. And you can see clearly, I think, that the big year classes in this haddock fishery were always occurring in years when the spring bloom was early. So I think that's a clear result. I think we could not produce this picture here without the use of ocean color remote sensing. I don't know any other way it could have been done. And I think that the, the result that these uh, successful year classes belong to an early spring bloom, I think cannot be contested. Yes, please. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. This is a, this is a relative number. I, I, it's a technical thing. It's it's the, the abundance of the larvae at, at a certain age, less than one, but a certain age in weeks, normalized by the spawning biomass of the adults. Okay, it's, it's, in fisheries it's a standard index. So uh, larval survival 10 is much better survival than larval survival 2. Okay? So here then are the people whose name is on the hypothesis. This was a Norwegian, uh, Johan Hjort, and he published in 1914 this monograph, Fluctuations in the Great Fisheries of Northern Europe, where he argued for the importance of larval survival and therefore the food for larvae as being important cause of variability in fishery for the adults. A very famous uh, scientist in, in uh, European fisheries. The other one is David Cushing, who crystallized this thinking into the so-called uh, match-mismatch uh, hypothesis. Now, uh, going back to the haddock for one more time, this is another interesting information. It, it's complementary to the stuff about the spring bloom. This refers to the autumn bloom uh, on George's Bank. I showed you George's Bank the other day. And the idea here is that in years when there is 
abundant food on George's bank. As a consequence of the autumn bloom of phytoplankton, that the adult females will be in good condition and will have a higher fecundity, a better spawning in the following spring. I think those results are quite uh, also quite convincing. Now, finally, on the fishes, this is work uh, supervised by Marie with an African student. Uh, the data are from the Gulf of Guinea, West Africa, off the, off the Ivory Coast. This time, this is a pelagic fish. I should have said, for those who don't know, haddock is a, a ground fish, demersal fish. This is a pelagic fish, uh, sardinella. And here we see the anomalies in the timing of the start of spring bloom versus the sardine catch in the following year. And again, uh, there is a strong, uh, significant trend in those data indicating the role of the food supply as one of the factors controlling the survival of the sardine. Now, I would switch now to uh, an invertebrate. This is the northern shrimp, uh, Pandalus borealis. I don't, can you read the writing there? It's a terrible slide. Eh? I wasn't able to change the color. Can you read the green? Okay. So what happens here? These are shrimps. And the, the life cycle is very, very bizarre of these things. But uh, we can give some of the details. The females carry their eggs, fertilized eggs, they carry them externally. So they have them in a, in a kind of a pouch, but they're, they're freely exposed to the water. And th these females are living at the bottom. So the development of the eggs depends upon the temperature of the water. Okay, so if water is warmer, they'll go faster. If it's cooler, they'll go more slowly. And according to that uh, time that has to elapse, eventually they will hatch. Then the larval shrimp will be up in the plankton and they'll be feeding uh, first on the phytoplankton and then on the small zooplankton. So here you have their feeding is related to some process that happens uh, at, at the surface. Whereas the development and hatching of the eggs is related to some process that's at the bottom of the water and might be 500 or more meters deep. So, in a sense, these are decoupled. I don't think you can agree. Here are some examples. Shrimp fisheries of the North Atlantic. The warmest bottom water is on the American side uh, and that will be around five or six degrees. It takes 150 days for the eggs to mature. In the Icelandic and Norwegian stocks, it's closer to zero and will take uh, 
more like 300 days for the eggs to mature. Now what happens when you compare the hatching and spring bloom all across the Atlantic Basin, you find it's very, very closely coupled one to another. So these are the different stocks. This is the Svalbard, Labrador Sea, here is Greenland population, and so on. Um, doesn't matter which one you look at, they, they will fit into this uh, tightly coupled. So this has to be something that's uh, arranged itself or evolved on um, a long time scale. And therefore, I think is uh, vulnerable to climate change. Here is another example on the shrimps. This is the bloom intensity, uh, also from ocean color. And you can see the size of the, of the adults, the female carapace length and the male, male carapace length. So when the bloom is strong, the uh, adults are going to be bigger. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this bit. I'm going to show two two uh, years of data for shrimp fishery off Nova Scotia. This year, 2001, where the shrimp larvae were in the plankton at the peak of the bloom here, which led to a good year class of shrimps, and another year, 1999, when these were offset. This is the uh, a small offset between the presence of. Uh, shrimp nauplii in the, in the plankton and the um, peak of the chlorophyll. So there, there is some uh, somewhat circumstantial, this, this was a less good year class, somewhat circumstantial uh, evidence for the shrimps. <coughs> so, uh, Seems to me that from those pictures I was uh, showing you, that um, the value of making this phenological uh, analysis and, and using it as information for fishery managers, I think, is um, has been uh, demonstrated. We published, uh, in 2007, we published uh, a retrospective paper about it, looking back to our original um, prospectus for doing this work that, that, that came out in 1996. So, I think there's still a lot to do with these phenological analyses and with ocean color data of the quality and accessibility that we have today, it's rather easy to do. For us, it was a 10 year project. Now it's almost, you can do it the same day. You know, it's just, that's, that's progress. It's, it's, Field has evolved. You could 
come in and uh, start doing it the same day. Now I take a small interlude to tell you about an um, international project called Safari. I see it's not spelled out. It stands for Societal Applications of Fisheries and Aquaculture. Something about remote sensing imagery, I forget. Started in 2007, is now in the uh, Geo Blue Planet, and it it's, uh, aims to make an international forum for um, those interested in combining ocean color, uh, any kind of remote sensing really, and fisheries. International forum, including. Uh, capacity building and those are the objectives it says publish a monograph we did that and this um, uh, some of the activities we had an international course in uh, India February 2010 and what I wanted to tell you is there's going to be another one same place next January 2018 so if you're interested in that please uh, look at the website and uh, you can talk to us also our first symposium was uh, pretty good and we hope this one also will be. Now, we go back to the work. As well as the concentration of chlorophyll, in other words, the abundance, we have to bear in mind that phytoplankton come in different types, different sizes, and different suitability as food, as food source for other organisms. So uh, if, you, uh, if you grow them in culture, they will appear to have different colors like this. And uh, here you can see small quantities. There really is a remarkable variability of these organisms uh, from one to another. So, for example, the cell size. Um, I think Bob Bruin will have talked to you about cell size, but there's another one of our uh, younger colleagues, Chauvin Lal Roy, who also works on this. Um, his paper, 2013, is uh, of a very high uh, quality. And he, here is his effort to diagnose the typical um, cell diameter of plankton on a world scale through uh, modeling work. It uh, really is a fine paper. And when you have this cell size information, you can apply it in uh, the so-called uh, size spectrum analysis um, using the models that are allometric in basis sometimes it's called metabolic scaling these days it's something I had worked on a uh, long long time ago it now seems to be coming back in favor it's picked up in uh, fishery science um, so if you're if you're up for mathematical analysis, this is one area, and you need, uh, to get into it, you need some data on the cell size. Now here's something uh, also rather new. Um, this author, Susan uh, Budge, here, is a biochemist in uh, Canada. And uh, we've been working with her to try to 
uh, estimate fatty acids in uh, phytoplankton using ocean color. And the fatty acid story is uh, complicated. I don't pretend to be an expert on it, but um, fatty acids are essential for nutrition of uh, all organisms, and uh, the big source in, in the world is uh, phytoplankton. There are different kinds of fatty acids. This one rejoices in the name of EPA. And there's another one with the name of DHA. Some are related with, uh, more with diatoms and some uh, not with diatoms. But uh, as a, insofar as it affects the food quality or the quality of phytoplankton as a food source for, some, for something else to eat, then one of the factors is going to be the fatty acid uh, composition. And so this is uh, also puts a premium on uh, being able to detect uh, different taxa from remote sensing, uh, f including uh, and especially the diatoms, as we showed uh, earlier in the week. So this is a, a, an algorithm to diagnose presence of diatoms, an algorithm due to Shuba. And so the algorithm was developed in, uh, on the Canadian side. Here, don't be confused, this picture here is from South Africa but it is only meant to be an illustration that in this uh, South African uh, Benguela food web, uh, this author, Philippe Curie, has shown, or has uh, synthesized, that uh, when the flora is dominated by diatoms, there tends to be a, a preference to uh, build uh, populations of anchovy, and uh, when the dominant phytoplankton is not diatom, flagellates that uh, you're more likely to get sardine. So when will you get diatoms? You will get diatoms when the water is more disturbed. Uh, you will get flagellates when the water is more quiet. And in the two cases, the fatty acid composition is going to be different, and the uh, resource uh, for organisms to graze on, copepods or uh, herbivorous fish, is going to have a, a different food quality. So uh, it's something to think about there. Now, I'm beginning to summarize. Um, can we list some applications of fisheries, applications of uh, Earth observation? The oldest kind of fishery is a harvest fishery, still going on. I'm going to mention that in a minute. Um, what I've been talking about so far is in the nature of trying to understand the biology of the exploited stocks in a fluctuating ecosystem. So that's what we might call intelligence for the fisheries management. In aquaculture, you, you, of course, uh, you have the harmful blooms that were talked about this morning, but also if you want to calculate carrying capacity of a particular place, then you have to calculate the prime production. That's a problem in remote sensing. We have a number of other uh, applications. I won't list them all. 
but um, there's plenty of them. Now, for the harvest fisheries, uh, if you talk about this in uh, public, you have to tread very carefully because so many times uh, you will talk about this and somebody in the room will say, you're just advocating high-tech overfishing. It's absolutely not the, not the point at all. Um, let me tell you, uh, the leading countries in this are India and Japan. So, India releases every day now, I think, Shuba, every day, on a daily basis, potential fishing zone advisories all around the coast of India in local languages. So and the consumers of this information, many of them have very, very limited uh, education. But they, they make very good use of the information and the information is tells the fishermen if you go to this uh, place you will have uh, a better chance to get your to get your catch so the nature of the information that goes to a particular place is you go in this direction for this many minutes and you stop and fish, and uh, I, I'm going to show you some uh, results of a verification of that in, in a second. Now Japan, and uh, perhaps Korea is also doing, I don't know, routinely delivers temperature and chlorophyll data to the, especially for the um, large pelagic uh, fisheries. I think in the Japanese case, the fishermen have to pay. In the Indian case, it's uh, quite free. So the point is, is not to do overfishing, but what the fishermen appreciate is that they spend minimum time searching. It means they consume less time and especially they consume less fuel. So the advantages of this are economy of fuel and time. And the Japanese fishermen say their life is better if they don't have to stay out all night um, and uh, always be tired. So here was an example of a a benefit analysis of the, sorry, of the uh, Indian case, they say, this is comparing use of the fishing advisory against the control. Reduction in search time is 65%. Increasing catch factor of two or four, and net profit increase to a factor of two to four. Okay, this is my last slide. Oh, Earth observation and fisheries really is still relatively new. There's still a lot to do. There are, there are products uh, already existing. They don't need to be developed. It could be, I, I, I mean, for example, the diet diet algorithm. 
that could be uh, integrated into Fisher's intelligence uh, tomorrow, if somebody wanted. Um, to actually get the best out of it will require a collaboration between the scientists, but also the uh, fishery economists and uh, the fishermen themselves. And as I've tried to show you, up until now, uh, or in, historically speaking, some real scientific giants have walked through this field and uh, we should do our best to follow their example. <laughs>